Hello, everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. My name is Gabe Gunning, and I have the privilege of joining you all this evening as we celebrate a thoroughly European Christmas along with Rick. Now, without further ado, I would like to turn things over to our tour guide for this evening, jolly old Saint Rick. Rick, over to you. Hey, Gabe. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. And, you know, I've got my spiced wine. And what I want to do this evening is spice your travel dreams with a trip all around Europe to celebrate Christmas in different countries. So I don't know about you, but I'm ready to travel. So thanks for joining us. And uh, we're gonna go to, where are we going? We're going to Germany, Italy, Norway, and Switzerland. And uh, I hope you're ready for a little traveling. Thanks so much for joining us. It's so great to get together every Monday night. Uh, as Gabe mentioned, this is our last one of the year. And then we're gonna take a couple of weeks off and we're gonna see you again on January 3rd where I'm going to be hosting a show about the very best of Switzerland, a nice wintry show. On January 10th, we're going to be joined by Samantha Brown. And Samantha has got a great TV series, and she's got a new series out. We're going to celebrate that. And Samantha and I uh, are going to share uh, travel skills. And uh, we've had her on our show before here on Monday Night Travel, and she's just great. And then on January 17th, my son Andy who spent the last couple of years living in Colombia is going to join us, and he's going to take us on a trip to Colombia. I know we normally go to Europe, but Andy's in town and we're going to go together to Colombia. But right now, we're going to go around Europe and I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, and I want to remind you, we've got our a little bit of holiday cheer here. We've got hot spiced wine. Oh, that takes me right back to Nuremberg, where I enjoyed this in an unforgettable way that I'll be showing you in a few minutes. In fact, I've got, ah, this is one of my favorite um, traditional Christmas treats. Nuremberger sausages, um, famously the size of your little finger with some beautiful mustard. We'll talk more about that when we go to the land of Nuremberg sausages. We've got panettone. And if you like Italy Christmas, uh, there's not a traditional Christmas in Italy that doesn't come with a little bit of panettone. Thanks again for joining us. Um, we're gonna start off with a little clip from our Rick Steves European Christmas special that kind of sets the stage. This was uh, shot, oh, 10 or 15 years ago, this show. And um, we had two crews going at the same time all over Europe. I've shortened it a little bit so we can fit into our normal Monday night travel time slot. And uh, of course, you can see the whole show when you like to at ricksteves.com, but not without the fun little behind the scenes clips and a little bit of commentary about what was going on when we shot these. Remember, we had two crews going and uh, uh, you can't be everywhere in Christmas at the same time. But thankfully in Europe, the Christmas calendar is long and busy. It starts, uh, well, in Norway on December 13th, you could got Santa Lucia Day, that's a big deal. And it goes all the way to January 6th, the Epiphany, which is a real big deal in Rome. So uh, enjoy this trip. And to start off, we're just gonna start here in Salzburg and kind of let you know what's happening as we celebrate Christmas all over Europe. Steve's, and it's Christmas time in Europe from manger scenes to mistletoe, from Norway to Rome, we're celebrating all over the continent. Bon Natale, Fröhliche Weihnachten, Joyeux Noël, Merry Christmas, and thanks for joining us. In Melting Pot America, Christmas is celebrated year after year with traditions that came over on the boat with our ancestors. In this holiday special, we're traveling back to the old country, to places of rich variety and deep roots. We'll explore the history behind our much-loved traditions. Joining friends and families across Europe, we'll discover a Christmas that's both familiar and different. England is filled with voices singing in the season. The short days around the solstice bring Norwegians out to celebrate the light of Christmas. Families, friends, and food are the centerpiece of the French Noel. An angelic Christmas presence fills Germany and Austria with magical wonder. Italy reveals the sacred nature of the season from its countryside to its holiest shrines. 
Nature, in all its wintry glory, seems to shout out the joy of the season in Switzerland. And everywhere, Christmas is celebrated with family, including my own, as together, Europe remembers the quiet night that that holiest family came to be. While each European culture gives Christmas its own special twist, they all follow the same story of how the Son of God was born on Earth, as told in the Bible, and illustrated over the centuries by great artists. You know, I got to say, I'm so thankful that I'm on public television, where we can show a sacred and traditional Christmas without all the, the commercialism and so on. And I wanted to start this Christmas special by going to the greatest paintings of European art history that tell the story as told in the Bible of Christmas and just sort of lay the groundwork of what all of these celebrations are about. So here with some beautiful choral music, we've cut together some classic Christmas themed paintings from all over Europe. The Christmas story begins with the Annunciation. An angel sent from God with a message for a young woman whose name was Mary. And the angel said, Fear not, for thou shalt bring forth a son, and you will name him Jesus. And he shall be called the Son of the Most High, and his kingdom will have no end. And it came to pass that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And Joseph, a carpenter from Nazareth, went to Bethlehem to be taxed with Mary, who was expecting a child. And while they were there, she brought forth her firstborn son and laid him in a manger, because there was no room in the inn. In that region there were shepherds, keeping watch over their flocks by night. An angel of the Lord came to them and said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. For unto you is born on this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And suddenly there was a multitude of angels proclaiming, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill to all. And the shepherds said, Let us go to Bethlehem, where they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now after Jesus was born, there also came wise men, and a glorious star which they saw in the east went before them. Guiding them, it stood over where the child was. The wise men knelt down and worshipped the child, giving him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The long-awaited Messiah had arrived. Okay, so that was the Christian story of Christmas, but of course the European cultures like to weave in pagan pre-Christian sort of celebrations. And I like to sort of weave in this anthropological approach to Christmas as well. So we'll tie in all of the, you know, the ways that different countries distinguish their way of celebrating Christmas, depending on what their pagan pre-Christian heritage was. By the way, this on camera here is such a long on camera. I just can't believe I was able to do this without a teleprompter. I don't think I could do this today, but somehow I was so excited about sharing this information. I pulled it off. We're in Salzburg here. It's the story that Christians have celebrated through the ages. We don't really know on which day Jesus was born. Historians argue it was likely in the spring as shepherds were tending their flocks. But in the fourth century, a Pope declared December 25th to be the official birthday of Jesus. Why that day? Well, Christianity was newly legal in the Roman Empire, and the clever Pope figured it would be smart if the biggest Christian festival coincided with the biggest pagan one, winter solstice. And throughout the land, people, Christians celebrating the birth of the sun and pagans celebrating the return of the sun have been rejoicing ever since. When it comes to traditional holiday images, Germany's Bavaria is the heartland. Here, we'll savor classic holiday themes, glittering trees, old-time carols, and colorful Christmas markets. These markets, called Christkindle markets, enliven squares throughout Germany. The most famous is here in Nuremberg. 
It's a festive swirl of the heartwarming sights, sounds, and smells of Christmas. Long a center of toy making in Germany, a woody and traditional ambiance prevails. By the way, this is that wonderful market in Nuremberg, and it's probably the best single Christmas market you could go to anywhere in Europe. Um, and there are a lot of Christmas markets. I want to mention, if you're going to be traveling during Christmas, remember Christmas Day is the day that sightseeing closes down. It's even hard to get a restaurant. So just like in the United States, be sure you know where you're going to have dinner. Uh, uh, before Christmas Day hits. It'll probably be in your hotel as uh, most of the restaurants won't be open on Christmas Day. But there's normal sightseeing right up to Christmas and the day after Christmas, it kicks back into the norm and it's a beautiful time to be traveling in Europe. But do remember, it's bitter cold. On that last on camera, I just had a little deja vu. I was watching it and there was, a, you could see the, the, the uh, uh, what do you call it? You can see my breath, it was so cold. But I was, uh, I would take refuge in a, in a heated mall right next to us. And then I would step outside and I would, my lips would kind of freeze up if I didn't get the, uh, the take figured out. It was really cold. See, I want to have like ski clothes if you're going to be traveling in the winter around Europe. Um, heavy boots, uh, mittens, scarf, hat, sweater. Uh, it, it's because you're out for hours at a stretch. When you go to those Christmas markets, by the way, you've got a chance to sample all the local traditions. And I mentioned Nuremberg's market is my favorite. It's really a great market. I don't see the point in going to a lot of Christmas markets. I see the point of going to a couple Christmas markets, celebrating Christmas in Europe, but then sightseeing and, and doing what you would do any time of year. When you do go to the markets, they're very traditional. Nuremberg's market, uh, very green. Uh, no disposables, no plastic. You pay a deposit for your hot spiced wine and you eat it in a traditional mug. Oh, that blue vine is just beautiful. Um, and uh, that's a, a fun tradition and it warms you up as you're out and about. And in the case of Nuremberg, they are very, very, very fond of their Nuremberger sausages and their mustard. Mm. And these are famously big as your little finger. And you'll find places all over town. This is like the equivalent of a hamburger. Three little sausages on a nice little bun with the mustard. And the mustard, I don't know a lot of German vocabulary, but you got to know mustard. Senf, S-E-N-F. And then there's different kinds of mustard. There's sweet and there's sharp. Sus and sharp. Be sure you know your vocabulary so you can get the most out of your eating. Ah. It's so much fun to go to this market because all of the artisans are local. Nothing's imported. It's all local made. It's all green. It's all people. It's all celebrating local traditions. And when we saw the um, Nutcracker, we filmed this guy and I actually tried to do it. So it's lip syncing the next uh, bit on the script. You can see the Nutcracker kind of trying to lip sync, not doing a great job, but we'll see him lip syncing the script here. Nutcrackers are characters of authority, uniformed, strong-jawed, and able to crack the tough nuts. Smokers, with their fragrant incense wafting, feature common folk like this village toy maker. Prune people, with their fig body, walnut head, and prune limbs, are dolled up in Bavarian folk costumes. And hovering above it all is the golden Rausch Angel, an icon of Christmas in Nuremberg. Rausch is the sound of wind blowing through its wings. It's a favorite for capping family Christmas trees. Bakeries crank out old-fashioned gingerbread, the Leibkuchen Nuremberg, using the original 17th century recipe. Back then, Nuremberg was the gingerbread capital of the world, and its love affair with gingerbread lives on. Shoppers can also munch the famous Nuremberg breakfast, skinny as your little finger and sip hot spiced wine. As in so many cultures, kids love their local version of Santa Claus. While Santa is a legend, his character is based on Saint Nicholas, a kind and generous bishop who actually lived in Turkey in the fourth century. Holiday gift giving, especially in Catholic regions, is often associated with the feast day of Saint Nicholas. I can work Martin Luther into any script. Watch this. Number six. But Germany is Luther country. 
Back in the early 1500s, the great reformer Martin Luther wanted to humanize the Christmas story by shifting the focus away from the saints and back onto the birthday boy, Jesus. Rather than jolly old Saint Nick bringing the goodies on December 6th, Luther established the idea that gifts would be given on the 25th by the Christ child, or in German, Christkind. But for kids, it was hard to imagine the little baby in the manger delivering gifts. So an angel served as the gift-giving Christ child. And somehow, the angel came to be represented by a young girl. She spends her reign spreading the joy of the season. The Christkind concludes by telling the enthralled children, if you're very, very gentle, you can touch my wings. Nuremberg's favorite angel then leads her fans into the children's section of the market, where expertly bundled kids enjoy a Christmas wonderland. Yes, the Christmas angel, the, the Christkind. And uh, she's like, she's got her own paparazzi. She's like a rock star. Everybody's following her around. When she was in that auditorium and she told the little kids, if you're very gentle, you can touch my wings. The kids just went crazy. I got to actually interview her. She had her own green room and, and her own handlers. And they gave me you know, a few minutes to actually ask her a few questions. And that's one of the DVD extras that you can see. If you go to ricksteves.com, you can watch the show in its entirety. And you can see a little bits we never broadcast. Here's a little bit of the interview I had with the Christkind. What's the most difficult thing about being Christ Kind? The most difficult part, um, also with ch children, because they have a illusion and they really believe that I'm the Christ Kind. And so they always ask me if I can fly and um, with my angels and how does the heaven looks like and um, who's God and a lot of questions and you can destroy this illusion so you have to be very careful what you answer to this question and so it's difficult. Do you have any childhood memories of uh, the Christkind? Yeah, a lot. Tell a me. Lot. Tell me. Um, every year I was at the Christkindless market. Yeah. We have an opening and, as, and on the opening the Christkind talks to the people. And I did this this year and last year, and you stand on top of a church and you talk to all the people who stand in the market. And I always believe that it's the real Christkind, of course. And it was for me, ah, oh, I can't explain this. This was a feeling just great. And you knew, you thought maybe you could do that someday? No, not, not when you were little. No, of course it not. It was the real Christkind. It was yeah. the real Christkind. And then it was the horrible day, as my parents told me that it's just a girl. And But on this day, I already said that I want to be the Christkind one day. Thank you very much. And thank Merry Christmas. Thank you, too. Merry Christmas to you. Oh, thank you. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Rome. This is home of the Vatican City, headquarters of the Roman Catholic Church and some of Europe's most sacred Christmas traditions. For centuries, pilgrims have hiked from all over Christendom to this great city. Domes and ancient obelisks still serve as markers lacing together relics and sacred stops, including the tomb of St. Peter, marked by the greatest dome anywhere. And through the ages, pilgrims have stopped here at the Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore. The faithful believe the original planks from Jesus' crib are in this ornate container. And here, in the capital of Catholicism, each Christmas, lovingly constructed manger scenes called Presepi pop up all over town. St. Francis of Assisi is credited with assembling the first manger scene in 1223. He used it as a tool to teach people the story of the first Christmas. Since then, in the creative teaching style of St. Francis, manger scenes often put Bethlehem in a local context. Instead of the Middle East, Italians have long set the Holy Family right here, in Italian settings. St. Francis knew that by putting Jesus in a place people would recognize, their own neighborhood, the faithful could relate more easily to the story of his birth.
and Prosepi range from the very traditional to the very surprising, like this one that imagines the nativity in an Eskimo village. So if you like the Prosepi, uh, I want to remind you, we had way more Prosepi than we could fit in the show. And we made a little photo montage of them. It's one of the DVD extras you can see at ricksteves.com. If you go to the TV section, watch the Christmas special and see below that, you've got little links to the different little extra clips that were never broadcast, like the photo essay or the photo montage of Prosepi. The ultimate manger scene is back on Rome's ultimate square. St. Peter's is where the Pope celebrates Midnight Mass each Christmas Eve. For Roman families, there are more than just manger scenes to see. For centuries, this lively square, Piazza Navona, has hosted a boisterous village-like holiday market. And I want to remind you, this goes on strong until January 6th, Epiphany. So if you're in Italy on the first week of the year, long after Christmas, you still have these kind of Italian style Christmas markets as they celebrate La Bafana and Epiphany. I'll tell you more about that in just a sec. That stays busy until Epiphany in January. The Christmas season in Europe stretches for well over a month, not to maximize shopping days, but to fit in the season's many holy days. Advent starts four Sundays before Christmas Eve. Then comes the Feast of St. Nicholas on December 6th. Santa Lucia Day is on the 13th, and Europeans don't wrap things up on the 25th. The 12 days of Christmas stretch from the 25th through January 6th. That's Epiphany, the day the three kings finally delivered the gifts. And by the way, if this looks like I'm in Rome, well, that's the whole idea. I'm faking like I'm in Rome. This is the Roman part of the TV show, but I didn't go to Rome with the crew. I couldn't be at two places at once on Christmas. So I'm here in Salzburg and uh, Salzburg is called the Rome of the North because during the very difficult times of the Roman church, during the Protestant Reformation, it was cities like Salzburg and Munich in, in Bavaria and Austria that stood by the Roman church. Consequently, Rome showered them with thank you gifts and those gifts would be relics. When you go to Salzburg, especially when you go to Munich, you'll find lots and lots of relics. And those go back 500 years, 400 years to the Reformation Wars. Uh, but here I am in front of the Salzburg Cathedral. And the Salzburg Cathedral, believe it or not, is built on a one quarter scale of St. Peter's in Rome. And it's a beautiful church. We were there on Christmas day for the mass and there was a full orchestra playing and the whole back wall was filled with musicians. It was a glorious place to be on Christmas. Finally delivered the gifts. In Italy, on Epiphany, La Bufana, a popular Christmas witch, flies over the rooftops, filling children's stocking with candy or coal. Between visiting their manger scenes and Christmas witches, many Italians are shopping for their big Christmas Eve dinner. When it comes to a festa, Italians like to buy fresh and local, and lucky Romans enjoy an abundance of farmer's markets. La Vigilia, the traditional Christmas Eve dinner, calls for all the trimmings. Here in Rome, that's lots of veggies and a nice big female eel. So if you happen to be with friends in Rome on Christmas and you want dinner, you're going to have some eel. And uh, we had so much fun going to the markets and then going to Santa Maria in Trastevere. Um, so we're going to go to Santa Maria in Trastevere right now. And when you look at this, it's just a reminder that uh, as tourists, we go to the churches and it just seems like they're just tourist attractions with great art and so on, maybe a concert in the evening, but they are part of the community and they've got their congregations and they've got their local mission to help people and so on. And here in uh, Santa Maria and Trastevere, uh, we dropped in on the Christmas banquet that they gave to all of the poor people and the homeless people and so on. And it was a beautiful opportunity to see Roman community action in, in, in action during Christmas. As anywhere, Christmas in Rome is a time of giving. The spirit of charity is especially alive in this neighborhood, which has come together for a special holiday meal at the church of Santa Maria in Trastevere. Tables have replaced pews, and the poor are enjoying a feast prepared and served by the community. It's a joyful occasion, 
and by all accounts, those doing the giving feel as blessed as those they feed. Okay, now we're going to go into Tuscany. And this is just a, a, a really vivid reminder that if you travel in, in a place like Tuscany in the dead of winter, it can be beautiful. There, you know, it's cold, but it's blue sky, it's crisp. The, the trees have lost their leaves, but there's a special charm. And uh, we're going to be traveling in the countryside now. And this is where our crew was joined by Roberto Becchi. He's our favorite guide in the Siena area. And Roberto lines up anything we need when we're uh, traveling there with the film crew. And he's also a huge hit with our travelers who hire him. Our, all of our tour groups work with Roberto when we're in that area. And Roberto and his guides know everything about their corner of Italy. And uh, in this next bit, you're going to see so many parents and so many children, and so many, so much love, so much community, so much care for seniors. It's just a beautiful slice of the Christmas spirit, Italian style. And the big part of that is a slice of panettone. And I'm going to be done with my Nuremberger sausages here in just a moment, and I'm going to shift over to the panettone. But you're going to see this beloved Christmas fruitcake here in just a moment in the context of Italy, where it's from. <laughs> Outside of Rome, in villages in regions such as Tuscany, Christmas celebrations are a little more rustic. The festivities, while low-key, are memorable. During a busy season that sometimes feels overwhelming, village life can be refreshingly simple. These jovial friends are playing an old game. The idea is to toss the panforte, the local fruitcake, close to the edge of the table without having it slide off. No, 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 no. These children are flip-flopping the gift-giving tradition. They're delivering another Christmas treat, panettone, a rich brioche made with raisins and citrus, to older folks who have no family nearby. While providing a bright spot in this grandma's day, the child experiences the joy of giving. And today, the children have another important errand. It's time to post their letters to Babbo Natale, the Italian version of Santa Claus. This special mailbox mysteriously appears each Christmas. Sacred music and prayer infuse this tranquil landscape. Here at the 15th century Abbey of Monte Oliveto Maggiore, reclusive monks celebrate their faith in a timeless fashion, as if one with the communities they serve. And in this town, the people are doing a dress rehearsal for a Presepio Vivente, or Living Nativity. On Christmas Eve, in this simple cloister, they'll recreate the town of Bethlehem on that holiest of nights. In the countryside, you'll appreciate how sacred traditions have deep roots. Here in this medieval Tuscan hill town, villagers stack neat pyramids of wood for great bonfires. The lighting of the fires is a signal to villagers dressed as shepherds to come and sing old carols.
It's a reminder that through the ages, Italy's humble shepherds entertained the faithful as they gathered by fires to warm themselves and await the arrival of Christmas. Here in small town Norway, Christmas is celebrated with a unique intimacy and a Scandinavian flair for community. We're in Drobak, about an hour south of Oslo. While it's Norway's self-proclaimed capital of Christmas, Drobak feels like any idyllic town on a fjord. Okay, so we're in Norway now, carrying on our Christmas celebrations all over the place. I wanna uh, just take a moment to remind everybody that Monday Night Travel couldn't happen without our crew. We've got uh, Gabe is uh, moderating today and Lisa is behind the scenes at the early show. Gabe was behind the scenes and Lisa was moderating. And we've also got Julianne. So uh, I just wanna thank you guys for making Monday Night Travel. We wanna thank all of you for joining us and making Monday something we look forward to. I wanna remind you that uh, we'll be answering questions later on. So if you have any questions about what's going on in Europe or what we're seeing right now, put them into the Q&A section and Lisa will organize those and we'll get to as many as we can during the Q&A part. Also remember that there are links to things of interest to each Monday Night Travels episode in the chat section. So you can go there and connect very easily with things that we're highlighting during the show. Also wanna remind you, We've got our Christmas sale going on, like most travel businesses, and everything that we've got in our catalog is between 20 and 50% off. There's a lot of great gifts there. And if you've got a travel on your gift list, or if you've got a trip coming up, you won't see better prices than this, and you can get on board with that. Um, we're going to Norway now, and Norway, it seemed very secular at first. It's probably the least church-going place in Europe. But the more we looked, the more we realized there's a rich and spirited Christmas sort of festivity going on. And we just lucked out in so many ways. It was unseasonably warm. So we didn't get the snow we were hoping for, but we did get snow in Switzerland. And I was really getting nervous about that. But thankfully we got snow in uh, Switzerland. In Norway, remember the latitude is really high up there. It's like Alaska. So it was getting, it's the dead of winter. So it was getting cold, uh, dark every day at four o'clock, very short shooting day. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it's my heritage. So I wanted to, I was determined to make Norway a strong part of this show. I was wearing my Norwegian souvenir, my, my, my beloved Norwegian sweater. It's a great thing to pick up while you're in Norway. But right now we're gonna carry on in Norway and see how my great grandparents celebrated Christmas. Here we go. It's Santa Lucia day, December 13th one of the darkest days of winter, and an important part of the Scandinavian Christmas season. All over Nordic Europe, little candle-bearing Santa Lucias are bringing light to the middle of winter and the promise of the return of summer. These processions are led by a young Lucia wearing a crown of lights. This home has housed widows and seniors for over 200 years. And today, the kindergartners are bringing on the light in more ways than one. The children have baked the traditional Santa Lucia saffron buns, the same ones these seniors baked when they were kindergartners. Taking their cue from Santa Lucia, Norwegians, cozy in their homes, brighten their long, dark winters with lots of candles, white lights, you'll never see a colored one, and lots of greenery. In Norway, as in the rest of Europe, pagan symbols, like the evergreen tree, survive disguised as Christmas traditions. The same's true with this sprig of mistletoe. In Scandinavia, it's associated with the Viking goddess of love. Hey, there's my sweater. This thing ages pretty well. I think it ages better than me. I'll have this sweater for the rest of my life, I think. For Celtic people, it was a sacred plant. They used it to heal the sick and enhance fertility. For most of us, it's just a handy excuse to steal a little Christmas kiss. Oh, that's a <laughs> the Norwegian spirit of Christmas extends even to the departed. Candles flicker in graveyards as families remember lost loved ones. And all over Norway, communities gather together in churches just like this 
as choirs kept Santa Lucia Day with a concert. You know, I was just thinking, I live in a little town north of Seattle. And we have our family Christmas services and we have our choirs and we have our tree lighting ceremony and so on. It's going on all over the place. There's sort of a, there's sort of a oneness during the holiday time that is really beautiful. And you experience that when you're lucky enough to travel during the holiday time. Think about this bit right here if you're the camera person. I mean, Carl, is having to anticipate where everybody's going to go. You don't get two takes here. You can't scout it. This is just, it happens once. It's either you get it or you don't. And it's complicated to be running ahead and getting set up and making sure everything is going to be looking right in the camera. And Carl and Peter just nail it. Here we are um, scampering with the choir, with the candles in their hair as they go out to the main square. They pour out of the church and they bring the light of Christmas into the town, and we were there to shoot it. It was just so exciting. And as the congregation follows the Santa Lucias out, more light of Christmas spills into this little fjordside community. A common theme across cultures is a legendary gift giver, not always fat and jolly, who kids butter up with treats. While I grew up leaving Santa Claus milk and cookies by the fireplace, the kids here leave a bowl of porridge out by the barn for the Yulanisa. These mischievous elves from the forest visit each Christmas not on reindeer, but with a horse, pig, and mouse entourage, and a bag of gifts. Every good child knows the Yulanissa is coming with an exciting reward. Just up the fjord, Norway's capital, Oslo, celebrates Christmas with a more urban charm. Streets are decorated. Locals not ready to rely on the Yulanissa are out shopping. And good cheer is abundant. Christmas in Oslo feels low key. You'll find it best not on the streets or in the malls, but in the homes with friends, and in music. Youthful voices fill the city's oldest church. The old Acker Church, which dates back to the 12th century, hosts the Norwegian Girls' Choir for an Advent concert. This just, it just brings me chills. And it great brings me reminders of how, how we had to scramble this evening. We had one night to capture live Christmas music in Oslo. The tourist board set us up with a concert at the big concert hall. It was terrible for our needs. We bailed out of that. It was pouring down rain. We looked in the what's on and we found another concert and it was no good for our needs. And then I learned that there was the Norwegian girls choir playing in the oldest church in Oslo, the 800 year old Akers church. And we drove out there, sort of on the edge of town, and we parked the car and we we're just kind of hopeless. It's pouring down rain, everything's fogged up in our car. I just huddle up and I, I rush into the church. I find the choir director, the concert starting in 15 minutes. And I say, excuse me, I'm so sorry, we didn't have a chance to get permission in advance, but we're from the United States. We're working with you know public non-commercial educational television. Is there any way we could set up and film your choir? And he said, sure. I couldn't believe it. So I ran out to the car, we gathered our gear. This is the first time we've ever had a shoot with a sound man. So we set up the sound uh, equipment and then uh, just when we're ready, the girls came in, the candles were lit and this stone church just filled with beautiful, ah, beautiful, beautiful music. Check this out. And imagine if you were producing this show, how thankful you'd be to be able to catch this. These, uh, th this is such a beautiful bit. I even. The girls even made it on the cover of our uh, CD with our favorite music from this experience.
Encore, encore. I want more. Oh, okay. You want more? I decided to add a little extra here. This is one of the DVD clips that we don't air, but you can find it at ricksteves.com in the TV section if you like. But it's another piece by the Norwegian Girls Choir. It's Joy to the World. And I'll tell you, listening to that, I just remembered how much beautiful music we got to hear in Norway. And uh, we put it together in a CD. It's the only CD I've ever had a hand in producing. And this is our, our three pack, very popular gift in our website. Uh, it's the CD with our favorite 20 pieces of music that we recorded in Europe during this uh, shoot. It's got our coffee table book about uh, everything we learned about Christmas during the shoot. And it's got the show with all the DVD extras. It's a fun little clip. I'll be talking about how you can get that for free after the show uh, if you support Bread for the World. But right now, we're going to enjoy a little joy to the world with the Norwegian Girls Choir with beautiful images from all over Europe during Christmas time. Check this out. In Switzerland, where the churches are small and villages huddle below towering peaks, the mighty Alps seem to shout the glory of God. Up here, Christmas fills a wintry wonderland with good cheer. Oh, we had so much fun filming in Switzerland. You know, I'm done with my Nuremberger sausage. I've got a little couple of buns left there, but my sausage and most of the scent, the mustard is long gone. I'm shifting into dessert mode now, and I've got my panettone. And let me just give you a bigger shot of this because I love my panettone. I'm gonna just start having dessert. And that's this uh, Italian uh, fruitcake. And uh, that's a big hit in Italy. And I'm heading into Switzerland here. So we're gonna have a nice, gross, a big hot chocolate and this isn't just any hot chocolate. This is hot chocolate with peppermint schnapps. Then you really feel like you're in the Alps. And this is kind of special for me for many reasons. But this is uh, uh, brings me back to my, my good buddy, bless his heart, Walter Mittler, the guy who ran Hotel Mittag Horn. He just passed away a couple of years ago, but he was just a saint for the travelers. And uh, for 20 years, I brought groups to Gimmelwald, staying in Walter's hotel. And Walter and I gave it a name. We got the hot chocolate, the peppermint schnapps. We called it a Heidi Coco. People thought that was the traditional name of it. We just made it up. And we sold Heidi Cocos like hotcakes because, well, we sold Heidi Cocos like hot chocolate with peppermint schnapps. That's what we did. That with some panettone. I'm going to just uh, invent a little fusion dessert right here as we carry on. We're going to go to Switzerland. And when I'm in the Swiss Alps, if you know my shows and you know my books and you know my tours, I'm very, very thankful to have a friend named Ali, who's the only school teacher in a little one-room schoolhouse high in the Alps in a little village where almost everybody has the same last name, one of the poorest towns in Switzerland, Gimmelwald. I stay with Ali and his wife, Maria, in their home, which they rent out as a B&B. &B. It's listed in our guidebooks and it is an amazing opportunity. You can stay with Ali and Maria. Uh, but when I'm coming into town with my TV crew, I call Ollie in advance and I let him know what I'd love to do. I'd love to go down the mountain on a wooden bicycle sled. And he lined one up for me. You'll see me on a bicycle sled in a moment. I want to go with my kids and chop down and put on snowshoes and chop down a tree and take it down on a sled into the village and set it up in your home. And I had this dream of finding a little troll-like man who could chop wood for us. And in Gimel, they have small stoves, so they have very small wood. 
Ollie set it all up. And right now we're gonna go to the Swiss Alps for a wonderful little peek of that delightful traditional Christmas high in the Swiss Alps. In these villages, traditions are strong. And warmth is a priority. Ovens are small, so wood is too. My family has arrived for a Swiss Alps Christmas. And my family flew in just for these, for three days. I mean, I'm so thankful. That's a lot of flying just to be on camera and celebrating Christmas for a couple of days and then fly home. But to have Anne and the kids here all together, man, it was beautiful. It made a little big difference for the show. Along with our kids, Andy and Jackie, my wife Anne has joined me here in the tiny village of Gimmelbar, where we're having some fun with our friends, Ollie and Maria, and their kids. <laughs> Ollie's taking us high above his village on a quest to find and cut the perfect Christmas tree. Still high above Gimmelwald, we're stuck. Okay. This was one of the most thrilling little bits of TV production I've ever had in 30 years of making TV shows. The sun is going down. We got our Christmas tree. Ollie's wife is in the little uh, mountain hut making uh, fondue. And uh, we're gonna sit down and she's gonna tell us about Figgelgeckel, how when you have fondue, it makes for a very convivial and cozy time. And the condensation on the window, we could shoot in and see all of this beautiful, beautiful family holiday fun going on. And then, the sun is going down, it's getting dark. And we there's a little window when we wanna be screaming down the hill on our sleds with the Christmas tree. And the cameraman's running ahead, stopping, going, okay, come on down, Boom, stop. And then the cameraman runs down, does it again. We've got our torches, it's getting darker and darker. You gotta get it right because when it's too dark, you gotta shut it down. And it just came together. It came together and um, at the very end, you'll see us going into the distance, in the dark with our torches. And I think Simon and Steve cranked up the, uh, the audio a little bit because the giggles and the happiness was just, just something else. Join us now for the idyllic dream Christmas in the Swiss Alps. Being in a hut for a little fondue. We've got the tree. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that was quite a bit of work. Mm. This feels just right in the winter, oh, doesn't so it? Good. Yeah. When it's cold mm. outside, you know, it's perfect. <laughs> Fico giggle means, um, Fondue is good, ukita kuti luna, and it, it's, um, it means in English, um, fondue is delicious and gives a good mood. So if you have a party, you know that it's going to be... Yes, everybody knows what figu gegel means. If there's, if there's yes. fondue, it'll be a good ambience. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's impossible not to linger in this cozy setting. Before we know it, the light outside begins to fade. Here's, here's to happy Christmas. Yeah. Woo! Cheers! Cheers. <laughs> As the sun sets, we've got our tree and take an unforgettable ride home to Gimmelwald.
Back in the village, the kids take the tree home, and we've been invited to enjoy another Christmas tradition. While I grew up opening windows on a paper advent calendar, up here, the windows are real. 25 homes decorate a window for each day of Advent. The sense of anticipation is the same as day by day Christmas approaches. Advent is all about anticipation. And for the kids, much of that anticipation is about presents, rewards for being not naughty, but nice. And as we've seen throughout Europe, each culture seems to have its own version of Santa Claus, who serves parents by providing children incentives for good behavior. Here in the Alps, it's Sami Klaus, that's Swiss German for Saint Nicholas, and his sidekick, Smoochli. My son Andy is playing Sami Klaus this year. Ollie's son, Sven, is playing Smoochli, and the donkey is playing himself. Each year, Kimmelwald's children anticipate a visit from this dynamic Christmas duo. Sami Klaus surprises the children and checks in his ledger to see if they've been doing their chores. Have you been feeding the cows lately? Then he might ask for a song or a poem. Sing. What would you like to sing? And the performance is always followed by a treat oh, from good. his big bag of gifts. Well, hope you have a Merry Christmas. Frohe Weihnachten. See you next year. Adia. Bye. <laughs> That's the year those kids will remember as the year Santa Claus needed a translator. That was so much fun, so much fun to see my son Andy and Sven having that opportunity to bring Christmas joy to that little family. Now we're sitting down to dinner at Ollie and Maria's, and this is just a classic Swiss setting. Grandma and Grandpa have come into town. You got all the kids together. Grandpa actually grew a big white beard just for the TV show because he knew we were going to be shooting there. After dinner, we sit down around the tree. We light the tree with real candles. It's tricky to, I mean, it's nerve wracking to be having real candles in the tree, but boy, it was just so atmospheric. And then beautiful touching moment. Grandpa sat down with the old family Bible. This is an old Luther Bible. We have King James version. They got the old Luther Bible. And just like Shakespeare sort of established modern English language, you know, Luther with his Bible established the high German language or the high German sort of uh, written language. And uh, we've got a shot of his hands on that old Bible looking just like the, the classic Dürer uh, etching. Uh, this is just a moment. And you know, it is so great to be able to travel and to see other families celebrating their special holidays, essentially as we celebrate ours and to know that it's going on at the same time in countries on both sides of the ocean. <laughs> Mission accomplished and it's time for dinner. Back home, Grandma and Grandpa have joined the gang as we settle into a classic Swiss Christmas Eve. After dinner, both our families gather in the living room. Lighting the candles is a treat our children will always remember. Three generations come together as Grandpa reads from the old family Bible. The evenings capped off with the sharing of gifts. Christmas. So now it's this on camera and I'm pulling myself away from the whole family scene and it's kind of tricky because it always takes me five or six takes to get the on camera right. And uh, we have to at remind the kids, keep on unwrapping, keep on doing what you're doing because we're still filming and we need you back there doing stuff and not looking at the camera and we need some liveliness in the background. And that sort of wraps up our Swiss Christmas. And then we're gonna go to the big roundup. And remember tonight, I'm just showing you four countries. 
Norway, Switzerland, Germany, and Italy, but there was also France, Austria, and England. And uh, in the show, we all come together and you see uh, you know, kids in Austria discovering the tree and maybe Jesus being added to the manger scenes and uh, the last Christmas mass of Pope John Paul II. It's all happening. And then all through the shoot, we were instructed to capture all the bells ringing and to get people in every country saying, Good Yule, Happy Christmas, and so on. And it all comes to a head right here. Um, the Eve is finally here. And right about now, all across Europe, our friends are celebrating this long anticipated night in their own unique ways. Hey, before we do that, Gabe, I think, I believe we've got a Christmas poll, right? So we're gonna go to have the big finale. But I'm curious if our travelers have a favorite spot to celebrate Christmas. Can you explain our poll to everybody, please? Yeah, so quite simply, we visited um, four countries um, and seen their Christmas traditions tonight, Norway, Germany, Italy, and Switzerland. And we would like to know if you could spend your next Christmas, maybe Christmas 2022 um, in Europe, where would you want to celebrate it? And I'm launching that poll right now. We'd love to hear from you. Okay, so click. You've seen all those places tonight. Which one would you like to go to? And I'll let you work on that. <laughs> and Gabe will be busy counting. And right now we're going to go uh, continue with this little sweep through Europe on the finale of our European Christmas celebration. Down the chimney, St. Nicholas came with a bound. In England, the family snuggles together, anticipating the arrival of Father Christmas. A little old driver, so light. Up in Norway, they're joining hands in song. In Burgundy, a toast starts the Revion, and Delphine's beef is finally done. In Austria, the children discover what their grandparents have been hiding from them. Final touches are made to the Bethlehem being created in Tuscany. And at the Vatican, people pack St. Peter's as millions around the world share a sacred and glorious midnight mass. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just a sucker for all of those beautiful kids, all those parents, just like us parents doing the very best we can to raise our kids and those chubby little fingers decorating the cookies and the beautiful singing and the decoration and grandparents looking on with pride and love. It's a beautiful thing. And it's a reminder that joy rings across the planet if we can get to know each other. Potentially, there's so much goodness out there. Gabe, how is our poll doing? Did you have a chance to count everything up? Well, Rick, uh, you know, never say that your vote doesn't matter um, because this one was truly neck and neck. Lisa and I were watching the numbers go back and forth and I'm gonna share the, the big results now. So it could be hard to see, but Germany edged out Switzerland by five votes, 436 five. Oh. to 431. Isn't that interesting? Wow. And then uh, Norway and Italy were both pretty close too in, in the so. race for third. 
for the and Bronx. elections yeah. have consequences. I guess all of us are going to have to go on a big trip to Germany <laughs> for Christmas next year. Elections have consequences. <laughs> Thank you, Gabe. And I got to mention, I got I got to say, I'm really enjoying uh, this Italian uh, Swiss mix here, the panettone and the Heidi Coco. And I hope all of you are enjoying your Christmas festivities and your holiday festivities and your sweet treats and your special drinks and so on. Gabe, thank you very much. And uh, that's an unforgettable, your, your, every vote does matter. Let's finish off with our Christmas finale here. And as Christmas day dawns, a joyful chorus heralds the birth of Jesus. Happy Christmas. Joyeux Noël. Noël. Johnny Vienachte. Buon Natale a tutti. Goyel. Merry Christmas. Frohe Weihnachten. Joyeux Noël. Happy Christmas. Ho, ho, ho. Frohe Weihnachten. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I wish you all a very Merry Christmas. And here at Rick Steves Europe, we wish you all a very Merry Christmas and happy holidays and happy travels. Hey, um, I've just enjoyed reliving all those Christmas memories with all of you. I hope you've enjoyed that swing through European Christmas. Gabe, do we have some questions? We have a lot of wonderful questions tonight, Rick. Um, before we get to them though, can we have our word from our sponsor? Well, thank you, Gabe, for giving me this opportunity, this little opening to get in here and sell something. And right now, I don't want to sell anything but the spirit of Christmas, helping our neighbors, loving our neighbors, taking care of each other. We are so richly blessed. We may not feel richly blessed, but when you travel, you know, on a global scale, we've got a lot going for us here. And it's just a beautiful thing any time of year, but especially during the holidays to think about ways we can help out. And what I like to do every Christmas is raise a million dollars to help fund the lobbying work of Bread for the World in Washington, DC, to remind our government that there are hungry people here in the United States and hungry people south of the border. And a national budget is a moral document. And we can help other people who are desperate. We can afford it. Even if you're not into love your neighbor, it's a way to invest pragmatically, practically, in a more stable and just world. We can do it. And for the last 30 years, I've been supporting Bread for the World. I said lobbying, and a lot of people cringe when you say lobbying because a lot of lobbyists do things you don't really like have lobbied for. But these people are lobbying for hungry people. If you care about fighting hunger, they are lobbying for the right cause. And our legislators wanna do the right thing, but they need to be encouraged. We need to have somebody at the table when they dole out all that money we're not becoming a big charity state, but we are realizing that a little investment in people who are struggling is a very, very good idea. So each year I raise, we raise together, all of us at Rick Steves Europe and all of you who are watching, together we raise a million dollars to empower Bread for the World. And we do it this way. If you can donate $100 to Bread for the World, I'll donate $100 until 5,000 people donate $100. And right now we got 4,400 and some people who have donated $100. This is a very expensive Christmas for me, and I'm loving every minute of it because I want to spend half a million dollars this Christmas to make a difference, and I bet you do too. <laughs> so if that at all appeals to you, and I got to say, a lot of people wonder, why don't we charge for all this fun we're having on Monday Night Travel? We don't want to charge, but if you really want to pay something, here's something you can do. You can donate to Bread for the World, $100. Bread for the World, bread.org. And if you donate on this initiative. And for the last five years, we've been raising a million dollars every year. We're going to do this. If you donate a hundred dollars, I'll match it. That's $200 for Bread for the World. And on my own penny, I will happily send you these three gifts. I've been raving about them sort of all night indirectly. We got the book. This is the book I wrote while producing the Rick Steves European Christmas special. It's a great book. We learned so much that we couldn't fit into the TV show. Lots of beautiful pictures and recipes for everything we ate. We also 
made a CD. This is the only Rick Steves produced CD in existence. And it is a way to spice up your Christmas music selections with a bunch of very catchy, but pieces you don't know from Europe. Uh, and that's 20 songs. And then you'll also get a copy of the DVD with all the DVD extras and some fun information in there. But these three gifts, it's a popular gift pack in our website, but you'll get them for free as a thank you. Or if you've already got that or you don't want it, you can opt for all the TV shows we've ever made on 17 discs in the DVD big box set. Or some people just give the money and they don't want it to get, that's okay too. Um, but what we wanna do is just take this moment to welcome you to actually make a difference. If you've got a friend or a loved one who's got what they need, they don't need more stuff, but you wanna give them something meaningful, give them 200 bucks of power by hiring an expert to go down the halls of Congress and explain to our legislators how we can make a difference. I'm so excited about this. Please, please, if you're moved to do so, go to ricksteves.com slash bread, or in the chat section, we've got a link to that, or you could go to bread.org. But one way or another, get in on the Rick Steves Bread for the World annual Christmas fundraiser, and we'll make a difference. That was pretty long-winded, Gabe, but I think it's going to inspire a few people to join us. Again, we've had 4,400 people already on board. We need 600 more people, and one of them just might be you. Thank you, thank you, and happy holidays and Merry Christmas. All right, well, Rick, um, our first question, I think is, is kind of a challenge for you um, from Jeffrey. Um, and Jeffrey is wondering, you are, you're very adamant about only packing a carry-on. Were you able to do that even when you were going for a Christmas where you were packing all of your big fluffy reindeer sweaters? Uh, I don't think I was. I probably had. I cheat when I'm filming. Simon, I send a little bag extra with Simon, my producer. He brings it over. I'm over there in Europe with my carry on the airplane size bag. But to be honest, when I'm filming, sometimes I bring an extra pair of shoes and some extra shirts. And in this case, I had all this great stuff, these big heavy coats and sweaters and so on. And uh, <laughs> we snuck it over. We're gonna be talking with Samantha Brown. She travels with a whole crew that she's got a different shirt for every day. I wear the same <laughs> shirt for six days in a row, as you've noticed. Um, so I pack a little lighter, but no, on the Christmas show, I, uh, I do not pack so heavy. Um, speaking of your crew, um, Matt was noticing, you said that during that uh, Norwegian girls choir, it was kind of last minute, but Matt was actually astutely noticing that you got a lot of different angles um, was your camera person just especially nimble at getting around during that concert or did you travel with a larger crew for this special? Just one camera, one camera. And, um, you know, you, you have to do certain things when you only have one camera. When I was interviewing the Chris Kind, you know, it was me talking to this uh, young girl, the angel girl. Um, after it was all over, the, they put the camera on me and I asked the questions like I'm talking to her. So what was the most difficult thing about your work as the Chris Kind? You know, I do that, but that's filmed afterwards. We have to remember what the questions I asked her so we can film them that way if we can. I was just noticing the art of the cameraman because he thinks like an editor and um, he'll shoot a picture of some candles on a, on a green evergreen branch. And, and that will give him, we keep the music going, but he can cut away from this shot. And then he shot that after the music was done, but they put that in when he's running around to get another angle. And then they come back to his angle there. Uh, and, and he will, a lot of that stuff is out of sync. It might be the harpist doing something else, but we artfully cut it so that you can't tell that. It might've been on a different song, you know, but the audio is from, from whatever song we were featuring. So normally we do the same song three times, but when you just bust in on a concert 15 minutes before showtime, you can't say, excuse me, could you do that one more time so the cameraman could get another angle? But, um, you know, Carl was just brilliant on that. And so is Peter. Both of our cameramen are, are just awesome. And uh, Dan, going to the Italy portion of your Christmas travels, was wondering, did you actually have the Christmas eel? Um, and if so, what did you think of it? Dan, I didn't have the Christmas <laughs> eel. Dan, I wasn't even in Rome. <laughs> I was faking like I was in Rome. The other crew was in Rome. We were uh, two crews going like crazy. We shot that in one, one Christmas. We shot the, we had two crews in the Greece, in the Easter show, but Greece celebrates Easter a week after the rest of Europe does on the Greek Orthodox calendar, at least in that year. So I had two Easters 
in 10 days. Uh, but in this case, we had two crews, one Christmas, and just went crazy as much as we could filming. But you know, we weren't in Norway on Christmas Eve. Uh, we were, and we had dinner with a family as if it was Christmas Eve, but they just bought the moose and, and opened the presents and everything five days before Christmas. And the kids were going, wow, we had two Christmases this year uh, because the TV crew was there and we were capturing as much of Christmas as we could on that busy season. Well, Rick, I'm pretty sure that I've seen video of you eating like rotting shark in Iceland before. So we'll give you the pass on the eel. I wouldn't hesitate. I'd love <laughs> to try the eel, but I've just never encountered it while I'm in Italy. But if you are <laughs> in Italy with family and friends on Christmas Eve, I understand that's what you're going to have. Um, so our next uh, question, Rick, is from the Switzerland portion. Um, and it comes from an avid viewer named Lisa Friend. Um, and Lisa is wondering, how hard were the sleds to navigate? And were there any good wipeouts that maybe weren't caught on camera? I don't know if you saw that. Did you see the, the wooden bicycle? with, with uh -huh. skis It looked on? very precarious to me. That was precarious. I had to do it. It was too good to miss. I could have sat on a sled <laughs> or something like that. But I said, give me this. Give me the bicycle. And uh, the snow was soft. And I spilled a number of times. But uh, <laughs> no, that was that, that was a real thrill. I mean, I'll never forget the, the fun of going down the mountain like a bunch of crazy kids with the camera rolling and uh, oh, it's just cool. All right, well, Rick, we have time for one last question. Um, it comes from, well, the Kell family was specifically asking if you've adopted any European traditions and incorporated them into um, your celebrations each year at home. Um, but a lot of people were just wondering more broadly, maybe even just what some of the Steve's family traditions are. Well, I was very fortunate to grow up with a, a little cabin up in the mountains by Stevens Pass here west of Seattle. So my favorite Christmas memories are going up to the ca cabin, the very uh, rustic little cabin, and we would trudge through the snow with all of our boxes and set it up and decorate the, the tree. And my, uh, my parents would somehow sneak a whole bag full of gifts up there. And we don't know how on earth they got there, but Santa always came. And uh, it was just beautiful to be up in the mountains on Christmas. And I love that. And uh, those are my favorite Christmas memories. Uh, but right now, uh, incorporating European Christmas into my life, it's, you know, we're, we're a Norwegian family. So we've got a lot of the, Nor <laughs> we got more Norwegian stuff in our Christmas celebrations than we realize, I think, just like anybody, you know, how did great grandpa do it? Well, that's how we do it here. How did great grandma do it? That's how we do it here. Uh, but I've picked up uh, a few culinary traditions. I mean, I love my uh, Nuremberger sausage. I, I love my uh, lefse. I, I didn't get a chance to share that tonight. I, I love my hot chocolate and shops. There's, you know, it's a delight to be able to travel and see how other cultures um, celebrate the same holiday you celebrate. And then you get, as a traveler, to kind of pick and choose and weave it all together. Hey, Gabe, thanks so much for moderating tonight. And I want to thank everybody for joining us. I just really look forward to every Monday night. I particularly look forward to this Monday night as we celebrate the holidays together uh, as travelers. And I uh, want to wish you all a beautiful holiday season, a Merry Christmas, and we will see you in 2022. Okay, happy travels. And once again, uh, thanks for joining us and best wishes as you and your families, God willing, enjoy a beautiful holiday season. Merry Christmas, Lisa. Merry Christmas, Rick. Good night, Gabe. Good night, Rick. And happy holidays to all of you. See you in 2022.